if you're not a good storyteller, there's no point in trying to be a filmmaker or a journalist or anything else. So you do tell stories. How engaged are you in those stories and how much do you care about that story? That, I suppose, is the central thing. And if you like, as a journalist, it's my job to tell the truth. If that truth is a truth which very few people know and which is being actively um, uh, denied um, or concealed, then by definition, uh, as soon as you start trying to tell that story, you are a campaigner. Now, I don't think those people think of those two things as being contradictory. I, I think they're exactly the same thing because if you're a journalist and you're telling the truth, if you are a campaigner, you must tell the truth, otherwise your campaign will fail or will be fraudulent. Um, and so uh, a determination to tell that truth in a sense, becomes a campaign, uh, and certainly with Sri Lanka, uh, it's become a, a, a campaign which is, you know, taken us round the world and to the UN and all the rest. Of it. <laughs> is there a point been a good where, where the campaign almost takes over the journalism? Yes, but hopefully that's after we've made the film. Right. Uh, and that was certainly the case with our film, Age of Stupid. We made it, and the whole time I was making it, which ended up being five years, it wasn't supposed to be so long. I thought this is my contribution to climate change. And when I finished it, I'll be able to retire. But then as soon as it came out, as soon as we started showing it to people, everybody was saying the same thing, which is, what can I do? And then uh, we've, we just felt, you know, we, we control, we own this film, we're distributing it. We kind of have the responsibility to now make it uh, have as much impact as we possibly can. And that's, why, that's how we came up with our campaign 1010, mm -hmm. which then was a whole new thing and is now an NGO and, as you said, running in 40 countries and is a, in a way bigger than the film now. Mm -hmm. But I completely agree with Callum that you've got to make an extremely good film first. Because uh, a lot of people I'm talking to now, they say, oh, I'm doing this film, film and this campaign, and it's this and it's that. And I'm always saying, concentrate on the film. You can't do them both at the same time. If you make a film that's brilliant and that's powerful and hits people, then a campaign may come out of it. But don't do both at the same time at the beginning because it's, it's too much. The other thing is in, in terms of sort of focus screenings. I mean, for example, this new uh, feature doc we've just done, um, we launched, we did its first screening uh, at the United Nations Human Rights Council in front of 200 diplomats and, and, and um, um, country missions. Um, and, you know, we watched delegations and spoke to them afterwards and had delegations come up to us and saying, we are going to change our vote. The Sri Lankan government has pulled the wool over our eyes we, uh, uh, just from one screening. Uh, and that had an effect on the UN vote. So in a sense, you can do these kind of targeted screenings. We're doing a lot of screenings in parliaments. We did a screening in, in uh, uh, we did a, a, a extract in, in the British Parliament. We're doing screenings in Geneva, in Brussels, in the European Parliament in a week's time. We're doing them all over the place. The point is that if you can combine those kind of influential screenings, some of them private, um, with country missions, for example, mm. with mass campaign and mass screening, so that, for example, in India, there have been mass demonstrations. The parliament was brought to, brought to a halt on three separate occasions with people demanding that the Indian government take vote for the UN resolution, all on the basis of our film, um, and, you know, waving articles that I'd written in the air in the Indian chamber of parliament. And so, I mean, that kind of, the combination of a popular campaign that you can build um, through television and through, uh, and, and through sort of public screenings and, and, and screenings which are built around advocacy, and... Um, and these very specific screenings with influential people. I think it's interesting because the UN, at the same time as we were making our first film, the UN, um, having realised how badly it had failed, um, was appointing uh, uh, appointed a group of experts, and they produced a report which pr reached very similar conclusions to ours. Um, and in, in a sense, that was able to be... That was enormously important because it was considered and, 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 and read by country missions and read by these people. The film... Uh, just had an extraordinary impact because people could see it happening in front of them. And, you know, people who have read the report have then seen the film and said the power of the film, because the evidence is there in front of you, is, is devastating. I think it's generally true that if a film only presents one side of a story, then all the viewers can see that, spot that straight away and won't be convinced by that. They, you have to show uh, both or many sides of um, the story. I made this film about the Narmada Dam in India and a really, 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 you know, most of the film was about the villagers who were going to lose their homes and they were protesting against the dam. But I obviously had to show the, um, uh, the government's reasons for doing that and spent a lot of time trying to get uh, interviews and in the end did and a lot, got a lot of interviews with the, um, the minister in charge of the dam and even got invited back, back to his house. And there's a brilliant scene, if I say to myself, when he's um, showing us around his house and he's got tribal artwork up on the wall of his house and he's just showing it off as 
beautiful artwork, but obviously we, the viewers, know that these are the same people who are going to lose their homes because of his dam. And I think if you show that something like that, show the, frankly, the hypocrisy, then, um, then that's much more powerful than just cutting out the other side of the argument. Briefly, yeah, only just very briefly, um, I mean, I, I think that there's, there's a number of things about fair. I mean, for a start, if you're making television programs, there's a statutory obligation on you to be fair um, and to represent uh, both sides. Um, that is not just a statutory obligation. It's actually a good thing. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, and, and it was something I would regard as a fundamental duty that I have not just making a television documentary, also been making a feature documentary. You have an obligation to be fair. And that isn't... I, if you believe something, uh, you know, if, you're, if you've collected evidence which shows something is true, um, then you are never afraid of the, the counter-argument. You're never afraid of not representing the counter-argument. Indeed, you want to represent the counter-argument because you want to convince people that here is a truth, which I have investigated and I'm trying to tell you. And here's what they say and here's what they say and, here's the, and, and you, know, you can see for yourself the truth. You can only see for yourself your truth and really believe that truth if you believe you've been told both sides. Um, so it's more than just a statutory obligation. You have to be fair. You must never be... Fr if there is something, if there is a, a truth or a view that you're frightened of putting in your film, I always say this to young filmmakers as well, if there's any interview you don't want to do, if there's anybody you don't want to phone because you're worried it might damage your story, then that's the person you've got to phone first because if you haven't done that, then your story is worth diddly shit. You know? So um, that, that's, that's, um, you know, that's not inconsistent with having a mission to tell a truth at all.